Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for it this morning is the Gospel reading from Matthew chapter 22. And this text actually immediately follows the Gospel text that we heard last weekend, the parable of the wedding feast. Now, let's be honest, this text is fairly familiar to us, isn't it? Well, at least one line of it is. We, we're quite familiar with Jesus saying, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. But I wonder how familiar we actually are with the context in which this saying occurs. I have a feeling that we're not quite as familiar with it as we might like to be, or we might think that we are. And, and, and that's a shame, really, because the context of this statement shapes how it should be heard. And so when we don't fully understand the context, we tend to mishear what Jesus is actually saying. And so a lot of people assume that this saying is primarily about politics. It's not. Jesus has something much deeper than he's trying to communicate. The real issue at hand here is identity. Whose are you? And then by extension, what does this mean for how you live your life? So we're going to focus on this idea of identity. And to kind of introduce it, I, I want to kind of set this up with a, an illustration of sorts. So I'll be honest, I'm, I'm not much of a movie guy. I tend to fall asleep during them, to be honest. Maybe that makes me an old man. I don't know. Um, but it doesn't matter how interesting the movie is. I just I fall asleep. Um, and I wasn't always that way. As a kid, I, I loved movies, and so maybe that explains why a lot of my favorite movies tend to be children's movies, because those are the only ones that I actually stay awake for. Uh, but one of my favorite movies that has always been Toy Story. Uh, maybe you've seen the movie, and I'm talking about the, the good one, the original, not all the, the garbage sequels. The original Toy Story. And... Um, the, the premise of, of this movie is essentially that there's this kid named Andy who has a bunch of toys. And these toys are alive. They can walk and talk and interact with each other and do things. Andy doesn't know this stuff because when Andy's around, they're just normal toys. When Andy leaves the room, that's when they get up and they start doing the things that they do. And so the, the story centers around uh, at least... The, the guy who is the main character at first, which is one of Andy's toys, Sheriff Woody. And Woody and Andy are best pals. They do everything together. Whenever Andy is playing, it's with Woody. He, when, whenever Andy goes somewhere, he wants to take Woody with him. Even when Andy goes to bed, he takes Woody to bed with him. They do everything together. They're almost inseparable. So much so that Andy has inscribed his name on the bottom of Woody's boot. And that becomes important in, not too far into the story, as another toy is introduced. A character named Buzz Lightyear. He's this space ranger with all the cool gadgets and, and things, and, and pretty soon Andy He's more interested in Buzz than he is Woody. And so Woody gets jealous. And this jealousy sort of comes to a head after Woody has had to spend the night in the toy box while Buzz spent the night with Andy. And so Andy has left the room in the morning and, and Woody climbs out of the toy box and he hears Buzz bragging to the other toys about how Andy has now inscribed his name on Buzz's foot, Buzz's boot. And, and so Woody is, is jealous, but what, what he does in that moment is, is significant. He, he picks up his own boot and he, he looks at the image of Andy's name that has been inscribed on him. 
And he remembers that he belongs to Andy because his owner's image has been inscribed on him. And so, with this in mind, I, I want to turn to our text for today. And, and I want to start by noting in this portion of Matthew chapter 22 that Matthew is very intentional with the way that he introduces this story. He wants to communicate uh, what's going on behind the scenes with the Pharisees, the disciples that they send, and uh, as well the Herodians who come along with them. Notice how careful Matthew is to describe what, what the Pharisees do, their ill intentions. They take counsel or they plot to entrap Jesus in his words. In other words, they're up to no good again, as the Pharisees typically are. And so they send some representatives to go talk to Jesus, and they say this. Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about any, anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Pause for a second there. Think about what you know about the Pharisees. They don't like Jesus, do they? Jesus has, has just been poking them and accusing them of lots of different things in our gospel readings that we have read through the last several weeks. He, he, he's causing problems for the Pharisees, and the Pharisees are growing more and more to really, really not like Jesus. So do you think this statement is genuine? Do you think that the Pharisees really mean the words that are said here? No, not, not a chance. These words are absolutely dripping with sarcasm and double meaning. And so, what, what Matthew's trying to do here is cause his readers to anticipate what Jesus' response is going to be. He's causing the careful reader of his gospel to recognize how Jesus, he's not going to respond to the inquiry of these men, he's going to respond to their treachery. And so, with that in mind, we come in verse 17 to the question that is asked. They say, tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, we have to be honest. It's difficult to judge the, the, the motives behind this question too much. Because we just don't know a lot about the Pharisees or the Herodians outside of what is what is made explicit in the New Testament. We just don't know a lot about them, but Matthew does make two things quite clear in this text. First off, the Pharisees don't really care what Jesus has to say. They, they, they don't care about his opinion about the law or about taxes. Their main goal is to trap Jesus in his words. That's the first thing that Matthew makes quite explicit. The second thing that he makes explicit is that Jesus sees right through their scheme. He's not going to play their game. He, he makes that clear in verse 18 when Matthew writes, But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Now, if we want to understand what Jesus says next, we need to stop and just, just make sure we're all on the same page and understand what the question that the Pharisees are asking actually is, because this is, this is important. Their question is, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? In, in other words, they're asking about God's will and law. Is it in accordance with God's will and law that we pay taxes? Now, this shouldn't really surprise us. Again, we don't know a lot about the Pharisees, but we do know that they tend to be fairly legalistic. So it shouldn't surprise us that they're asking about the law, but... It's almost a bit ironic that they're asking about the law at the same time because Matthew makes it clear in the, the portions of his gospel that follow that the Pharisees don't really actually care about the law. They're just pretending to care about the law. They thought that it was God's will to oppose and hinder and ultimately destroy Jesus. That's what they thought was the essence of God's law. But Jesus knows this. Right? And, and so that's why he responds in the way that he does. 
He responds to their question. He doesn't answer it. This important distinction. I'll tell you what I mean in a second. Jesus says, starting in verse 19, show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, whose likeness and inscription, literally whose image is this? They said, Caesar's. And he said to them, therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled. And they left him and went away. My question is, why do these men leave marveling? Have you ever, ever thought much about that? Why do they leave marveling? It's not because Jesus answers their question. He doesn't. He doesn't say anything about the will and law of God. And the only mention he makes of taxes is to dismiss their comment. That should tell us that taxes and politics isn't the point of Jesus' response. So why do these men marvel? Well, I have to think that the reason they marvel is because these men know their Bibles, and they recognize what Jesus is doing. They recognize the image of Caesar that is on this coin, but they also recognize that there's another image in the Bible. Because they know Genesis 1, how the image of God has been placed on them. And so Jesus' point is, he wants to communicate, not about politics, but about the image of God, how God has inscribed his image upon his children. He did that with Adam and Eve in the garden. And he does that with all of their descendants. And so we could sort of paraphrase Jesus' response to these men in this way. He's effectively saying, render to God the things that bear his image. That is you. You and I bear the image of God. All, all humanity bears the image of God in a sense, but you and I as children of God bear the image of God in a more significant way. Because we have had the image of the crucified and risen Jesus inscribed upon us in our baptisms. And because of that, we should let these words of Jesus be a challenge and a warning to us to not let ourselves become like these Pharisees who are more concerned with secondary matters than with the primary issue of following Jesus because we have his image inscribed upon us. Because in baptism, Christ has claimed you and I as his own. You have had the sign of the cross in baptism inscribed both upon your forehead and upon your heart to mark you as one redeemed by Jesus Christ, the crucified. You belong to him. So Jesus challenges, render to God what belongs to him by submitting to Jesus in all areas of your life because you have had his image inscribed upon you. In the name of Jesus, amen.